So when Father Chris announced that we were going to be preaching through the book of homilies, he said that he got all the tough ones and I got the easy ones. I think he's wrong. Uh, none of mine have been particularly easy. And today we're ending this sermon series on the fear of death. The fear of death. Yeah, yeah, woohoo. The fear of death. It's real, isn't it? It's real. It's okay to acknowledge that. I remember times, especially when I was a child, that I really struggled with it. Really struggled with it. I can remember being just a small kid and surrounding myself or myself with all the stuffed animals that I had in my bed, hoping that if something came in to kill me, it wouldn't be able to find me among all these stuffed animals. I remember having to fall asleep to the sound of my mom doing the dishes at night because that let me know that there was a human on that side of the wall and that everything was going to be okay. Being a minister's kid, death was sprung on me pretty early as well. And I know that I was afraid of the unknown. That was one of my biggest fears, is what happens after death. I had a limited understanding of death and eternity, and that just scared me. Scared me to the point, again, that it kept me up at night. I heard sermons where the preachers would talk about death and eternity and how death would come to us all, and it does and it will. But my young fear was clouding my understanding of that. And sometimes our adult fears cloud our understanding of that. Then we moved to Texas so that my dad could attend seminary. While we were there, we connected with some distant relatives who lived there. My grandmother's cousin, Langdon Withers, good man, good man. But guess what he did for a living? Joker ran a funeral home. Guess where they lived? Above the funeral home. Guess who they invited over for dinner? Us, my parents, my sister, and nine-year-old me. I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified, probably because on the way there, my, while my dad was driving us, he told us that we were going to have to eat off of a coffin. They didn't have a kitchen table, so we had to eat off the top of a, top of a coffin. Now, I'm not even kidding. He really said that. And I remember that 30-something years later. Now, I usually begin a sermon with a lighthearted story, and I really struggled with this one because death is one of the last things that I do want to joke about. But this was no joke to nine-year-old Wesley, as funny as that may be. I was terrified. Terrified. Cousin Langdon decided to take my dad on a tour of the facility. And since I was too scared to do anything else, I went with him. The chapel was nice. The large foyer where you greet people was really nice. The morgue was clean. It was very clean, but it wasn't nice. Terrified me. Every, yeah, they showed us the morgue, and there were people in there. We didn't get to see the people, though, thankfully. But every single noise that happened in that house scared me the entire rest of the day scared me to death. Not only was I afraid of my own death, but I was afraid of the dead people in that freezer deciding to come up and join us for dinner. Again, when I say that I had a real fear of death, I'm not exaggerating. It was real. Now, I know that's a funny story. I know it is, but the older we get, we tend to think about it a little bit more, don't we? Perhaps not even so different as my nine-year-old thoughts. We tend to think about it for different reasons, though. It's usually no longer a fear of the dead coming after us, like I had. For some people it is, but rather it's the fear of the unknown that I talked about earlier. It could be the loss of someone, the fear of the loss of someone, or it could be the fear of losing what we leave behind. Now, Archbishop Tom and Thomas Cranmer begins the ninth homily in the first book of homilies with this. It is not to be marveled at that worldly people are afraid to die, for death deprives them all of worldly honors riches, and possessions, and the worldly person counts themselves happy with the fruit of these things, as long as they may enjoy them at their own pleasure. On the other hand, if they are dispossessed of such things without hope of recovery, in other words, if they lose them without ever hope of getting them back, then they cannot but think of themselves as unhappy, because they have lost their worldly joy and pleasure. And then he goes on to say, there are other people other people who this world does not so greatly laugh at, but who are vexed and depressed with poverty, sickness, or some other adversity. They fear death partly because the flesh naturally abhors its own sorrowful end, which death threatens them with, and partly because of sickness and painful diseases, which are very strong pains and agonies in the flesh, and commonly come to sick people before death, or at least accompany death when it comes." So in these two passages from the ninth homily, we see that Cranmer is speaking to those who fear death because of their worldly possessions that have a greater hold on them than their understanding of eternity or their hope of eternity. 
And he's also speaking to those who fear the pain and the suffering that go hand in hand with death in some cases. But then he goes on to speak of yet another kind of fear. Although these two causes seem great and weighty to a worldly person and move them to fear death, there is another far greater reason for them to fear death. And that is the state and condition to which at the last death brings all those who have their hearts fixed on this world without repentance and amendment. This state and condition is called the second death in Revelation 21.8, which follows after bodily death. Revelation 21.8 says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, Cranmer goes on to say that this, this, the third example, is that of which we should truly be afraid. It isn't losing what we leave behind. It isn't the pain and suffering that may come hand in hand with death. No, it is a state of eternal damnation that greets those who die without faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is what we should be afraid of. And believe it or not, that should also be a great joy for those of us who do have true faith. For those of us who cling to the hope in Jesus, this is a good thing. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For those of us who believe in Jesus, death is not the end, but it's the beginning. Yes, it is the, time of our, the end of our time here on earth, but it is the beginning of our life in eternity with God. As Cranmer himself says, everlasting thanks be to Almighty God forever. No, it isn't a thing to be feared. For us, it is deliverance from death. It is the defeat of death. It is a deliverance from the pain and suffering of this fallen world and an entrance into the rest and the beginning of eternal joy, glory that God has given us through Jesus Christ. This bodily death that we all face is the entrance to eternal life hope. As Jesus tells the thief dying on the cross next to him, the one who professed faith, this day you will be with me in paradise. This day. This day. Don't fear the unknown. Don't fear the hidden, the hidden fees or penalties. Because you believe in me and profess me as Lord, this day you will be with me in paradise. We need to cling to that. As I mentioned earlier, I've known the fear of death in many of its different forms. I have, and I'm not saying that I'm here ready to go like this. There are still things that I want to accomplish. There are still things that I want to see. I want to see my children grow up. But death doesn't have a hold on me, a fear like it did before. I think my, death, my fear of death early in life was a fear of all three of those things which Cranmer warned us about. I was afraid of losing this world. I was afraid of dying in pain especially when zombies came to eat me. That would be painful. I was afraid of the unknown because my faith wasn't mature. I was partly afraid because every Baptist church in the 1980s were showing those dang movies that scare you to death. They try to scare you into salvation. That's not what I'm trying to do with this sermon. I'm not going to show you a thief in the night at a coffee hour. Again, I was afraid of the unknown because my faith wasn't mature. It just wasn't. And that's the last part that I want us to focus on now. This is one of those rare times that I'm going to say to the room, if you're lost and you don't believe in Jesus, this sermon is mostly not for you. Come see me after class. I'm speaking now to those of you who do confess faith in Jesus Christ, and I'm speaking out of love and honesty and boldness when I tell you that you have nothing to fear. We serve a Lord. We serve a Lord who is faithful to us, a risen Lord, and he is faithful to us who have faith in him. Why should we be afraid to die when we have so many promises in the scriptures of eternal hope and eternal joy? And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's 1 John 5, 11 through 13. 
And then Jesus himself tells us in John 6, verses 40 and 47, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And then truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. You have nothing to fear. God is holding you in his hand, and he will not let you go. He won't let you go. Rest in that and place your faith in that. Place your faith in him and the knowledge and hope that he is holding you forever. Your fears, your struggles, your times of doubt, the sins for which Jesus has already paid the price, let them go. Let them go and cling to the hope that is given us, that death, for those of us who believe, is the true beginning of life. Now, this doesn't mean that we should go and boldly tempt death. Not at all. No, God warns us of foolishness. Don't go and play chicken on I-24 on the way home. Does this mean that we shouldn't grieve? Does this mean that we shouldn't mourn? No. Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend. Does this mean that we are weak if we suffer in pain and weakness and sickness? No, not at all. Jesus himself asked three times, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. The cup that Jesus was referring to was the suffering that he would bear on the cross for our sins, the suffering that he took for us. That suffering was the penalty for our sin, and that suffering was the price paid so that you and I may greet death as the entrance of eternal life and eternal joy. And of suffering and sickness, Cranmer said, let us with patience run this race that is appointed, suffering for the sake of him who died for our salvation, all the sorrows and pangs of death, and death itself joyfully when God sends it to us, having our eyes always fixed on the head and captain of our faith, Jesus Christ. Now that isn't a stern warning for those who suffer, but it's a loving pastoral encouragement to finish this race well, knowing who we will see when we cross the finish line knowing who greets us at the end. So I encourage you not to shy away from the topic of death or the thought of death, but to prayerfully consider it. It's not a topic that we like to dwell upon, but we've had to come face to face with it in the last few years, haven't we? I know for many of us, we had a wake-up call about three years ago. The COVID pandemic was a shocking reminder that our time on this earth is limited and our days are numbered. We all had friends who died. We would say before their time, but God had a plan. But we all had friends who died before we were ready for it. It brought to light where and in what many of us placed our hope. The fear of death was evidenced in the anger and bitterness, and in some cases, the walking away of faith. There are many, many people who still haven't returned to churches. It shows, it's telling. But for those who believe, I hope, that it was a time to consider our faith and to consider our future in Jesus Christ. A time to remember that we are but dust and to dust we shall return. A time to build our faith and encourage faith in our families. Cranmer was no stranger to death. I mean, think of the mortality rate that they faced in his time. Think of the death that he faced. But he encourages us to therefore let us be diligent that our faith and hope in Almighty God and in our Savior Christ does not fluctuate and fade, and that the love which we have for him does not turn cold. Again, don't shy away from the topic of the thought of death, but greet it with a spiritual maturity, knowing that it may be the end here on the earth, but it is the beginning of eternal life and hope. If you have strong faith in Jesus, boldly carry on resting in his hope and promises. Tell the world about it. Tell them, show them with your life and courage. If you have faith in Jesus, but you're shaking like a leaf and you're still afraid of death, you still have that fear that nags at you, know that you're not alone. Know that you're not alone. Know that you're loved, that our Father sent his Son to die for you. Yes, even for you. And that he is holding you fast in his hands and will not let you go. I know this life is full of ups and downs and every kind of emotion that we can imagine. And sometimes they all hit us at once. But God and his love for you are constant and true and real. Don't give up. We won't give up on you and neither will God. If you don't have faith, 
Again, see me after class. Let me or any of us here tell you how much you are loved and lead you to a faith that is not bound by time nor this earth. Turn to God, confess your sins, and believe so that you too may no longer see death as the end, but the beginning of eternity with the Father. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.